This is you. You look like everyone else. You act like everyone else. Life is bland, colorless, and sometimes hopeless. Until you finally saw him. You witnessed the resurrection of Jesus in and through your own life. And suddenly, everything in you began changing. And then others could see it too. You were becoming different, alive, free, full of joy and hope. The change is undeniable. The whole world could see. You are a witness. This morning we're going to begin a two-part series on the Holy Spirit because it is the Spirit of God in us that is the witness through us. We, I believe, are defined by the reality of an infinitely good God. We live in a world that does not know that God is good. We live in a world in which people don't know they're loved. And one of the primary ways they know is through us. And the reality is that the only way to live Jesus is in the power of His Spirit, not in the brokenness of our own spirit. And if we go through our lives living out our own wounding, if we go through our lives living out our own sadness, uh, offering our own opinions, thinking our own thoughts, um, doing our own thing, working our own will, seeking our own way, if we go through this world in that way and then add a little bit of God, we've added none of God. We've simply failed to be a witness, and we've failed to live Jesus. The only, the only, the absolute only way to live Jesus is in the power of His Holy Spirit. So today, what I'm going to ask you to do is to reject life in your spirit and to begin a new life in His. 1 Corinthians 2 Um, verse 16 says, but we have the mind of Christ. Oh my gosh, when I think about um, life in my own mind, um, well, let me just say that sometimes, just being a little transparent, between this year and this year, it's crazy town. Anybody with me? (laughs) You know, between here and here, um, you know, there's a whole other world, and, and yet, in the Spirit of God, We have the mind of Christ. So today, I want you to meet the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, um, Jesus says something really profound. He says, I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go, the counselor, and the the trouble with the word uh, translated in English is not that there is a lack of confidence in your English translation, it is simply that that this word means many, 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 many things. And so the word is paraclete, it's one who comes alongside, it is counselor, comforter, encourager, guide, intercessor, it is source of power, it is so many things, but it is all a reference to the Holy Spirit. Unless the counselor comes, um, unless I go, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. The truth is, the modern church is still grieving the fact that Jesus is gone on earth, while Jesus is rejoicing that the Spirit has come. And and we think we would be so much more confident if, like, we could walk around like the disciples with Jesus. Oh, yeah, you think that? Well, well, come on up here, Jesus. You know, um, watch what Jesus does now. But lacking that confidence, you know, we're, we're like the little kid facing the bully and his big brother's not there. That's how we act. But the truth is, Jesus said in, in John chapter 16, verse 5, Now I am going to him who sent me, yet, yet none of you asks me where you're going. And because I've said these things, you guys are all filled with grief. You're sad. But Jesus is saying, don't be. I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
I don't know about you, but we get lots of packages at our door. Anybody? Okay. I'm not sure that's the smartest way to do things in a broken world, you know? <laughs> I'm surprised more of them don't disappear. But, you know, so, so there have been times we've been in a house, like, waiting for something, like ink for the printer. And we've been waiting for something and, and frustrated. And I've, I've looked out the little, you know, we have the little kind of little frosted glass on the door. And I look out, and I, I don't see a package. And it's like, where is it? And the truth is, uh, on a couple of occasions, it's already been there, but like set off the side, like he put it under the bench or something like that. It was already sent, but I didn't receive it. And in the same way, there are many of us here who are looking for the missing piece, not the the piece that's going to make everything instant and easy. That's not the piece we're looking for. Some of us are looking for some magic bullet in Christianity, uh, in the fellowship of Jesus, that's going to make everything easy from this point forward. There is no such thing. But, but the reality is there is the gift of the Spirit that is going to make everything good from this point forward, to make everything joyful, to make everything right and empowered from this point forward. And many of us are sitting inside, looking out the window, waiting for something of God when Jesus has sent it. We just have to open the door and receive it. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt uh, of, uh, in regard to sin and righteousness and of judgment. In verse 12, Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. But when the Spirit, when He, the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. When you and I open our hearts and let the Holy Spirit in, in every arena of our living, the Holy Spirit will will reveal truth. He will guide. He will will never leave us in the dark. He will never leave us alone. He will never leave us thinking crazy thoughts in our heads. He will guide us into the truth. All truth. He will not speak his own. He will speak only what he hears. The Father is though the Father whispers into the Spirit's ear and the Spirit whispers into ours. And, and he will tell you what he hears and he will tell you what is to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. The Holy Spirit is all about revealing, revelation, uncovering, bringing understanding, closing the gap. All that belongs to the Father is mine, and that is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Guys, I'm telling you, there's a whole new realm of living uh, Jesus and of witness and of freedom and of being you by the power of the Spirit. And there is a you that is the broken you in sin and the gravity of the fall pulling you down. And then there is the you redeemed that is Christ in you. And it is the Holy Spirit empowering you. And the the miracle, I think, of the Holy Spirit as he lives in each one of us is not that we all become kind of blended all together um, in, in like losing personality. I rather think it's that the truth that the infinite God begins to reel his infinite good through each one of us so that through the Holy Spirit you become more you than you could ever be otherwise. So meet the Holy Spirit and open the door. And you see, receiving the Holy Spirit um, in receiving Christ is not about being odd for God, it's just God. It isn't some strange thing, it's simply being filled with Jesus. It's the normal Christian life. And the truth is, if we aren't filled with the holiness of Jesus' spirit, then we are filled with the unholiness of our own spirit. And I want you to know that between the two realms of light and dark, heaven and hell, the kingdom of heaven and the the kingdom of, of, of the world, there is no middle ground. There is no gray. There is only good and evil, God and Satan, There is only our choice to seek the kingdom or seek ourselves. A lot of times I I hear people say things like, well, that's just me or that's just them. Well, all I can say is that's probably just hell because um, making excuses for living uh, unchrist-like or making excuses for not surrendering and submitting to Jesus, those excuses just aren't going to fly at the judgment seat of of God. So, you and I are called from being lost to being saved. You and I are called from being self-focused to being Christ-focused. You and I are called to literally give away our lives. And all that we think, 
and all that we naturally want, the flesh that we want to please, the self that we want to serve, we are called to die to all of that. And it is a radical, high cost, high commitment call. And we can't dumb it down and cheapen it. Either you and I give our lives away to Jesus or we keep them from ourselves. Either we give our lives away and keep them forever or we keep them here and lose them forever. The Holy Spirit, he is as much a natural, just um, fitting and proper and, oh, that makes sense, kind of a, of a reality um, in the life of a believer as rain in the spring and warm in the summer. I do not wake up surprised that it is warm in July. Any of you all? I mean, we might talk about it, you know, but it's just kind of supposed to be that way. You know, I don't, I don't go to the Rocky Mountains and, and, uh, or the Grand Tetons and, and, and then look around and say, well, you know what, I am so surprised it is not flat. Well, this is the mountains, and in the mountains there are peaks, and that's, that's the way not only that it should be, it's, it's beautiful. And so, please, whatever you've heard about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not about being odd for God or, or different. It, the Holy Spirit is about having the mind of Christ and expressing that mind in a unique way among all the billions who've ever lived. You express the, the life, the love, the, the joy of God in a way that no one else ever has or ever will. And God's counting on you to do that as his witness. In John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, Jesus has a conversation with a very knowledgeable uh, religious person named Nicodemus who has grown up, uh, we might say in the church, he's grown up in the synagogue and, and at 13 was pronounced a man in his bar mitzvah be, to be a son of the covenant, um, memorized vast amounts of scripture. Um, in, in, in one of my grad school experiences, I, I, um, I was uh, taking a Hebrew class with Jewish students who'd grown up speaking Hebrew all their lives. And I had learned it silently. And, and I just remember being so incredibly impressed, <laughs> you know, um, by, by the beauty of the sound of, of the Hebrew language. And I had about three weeks to learn how to speak it before the next exam. This man spoke it, lived it, read it for hours, and I do mean hours, every single day, and taught it on the Sabbath. And here's the conversation that he has. Rabbi, I know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Your heritage and your knowledge cannot bring about a transformation of your spirit. How can a man be born again when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb. To be born, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, unless um, uh, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised by my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going, and so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. There's just this natural movement of God in the life of a believer that is beautiful, that, that is the scent of Jesus, that, that, that is a hint of glory in a broken world, that is light in dark, that is not, um, you know, uh, finally and completely uh, saved and glowing as an angel, but in the broken of a believer's life, there is the awe and wonder of God alive. And we are a witness. The Holy Spirit, uh, contrary to what you heard, and to be filled with Him, never calls attention to Himself. Um, and, and if you are around a body of believers who's always focusing on the Holy Spirit as the object, uh, um, there, are, there are not, in my opinion, in line with the ministry of Jesus or of the book of Acts in the New Testament. Holy Spirit is the invisible bridge to God, the revealer of Jesus. He is the ultimate networker. He never calls attention to himself, but, 
He sets up our connection and then invisibly empowers us to live an ever-growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so um, it is this amazing reality that we are invited into. So as, as you rethink your life, I want you to meet the Holy Spirit and hear the invitation of God into the most natural life that you've ever imagined. Better than, than you could have seen. Because you see, we've tried the religious, we've tried the churchy, but the only way to live Jesus is in the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way to reach the world with the message of God's love is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Arguing is not witnessing. Um, uh, hating and condemning are not witnessing. But living in the power of Jesus, living the life of Jesus on earth, it is a revelation and, and it helps people see the good of God and turn to the love of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, For we have not received the uh, spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. So many of us here today are grieving the pain of our lives. We're grieving the loss of love that we long for, but you don't know what you've been given. In Christ, you've been given all the fullness of God. And it's yours. That's why Paul prayed, I, I pray that we might have the power to comprehend the, the depth and the breadth and the height and the love of, of, of God, this love that, that exceeds understanding, that you might know a love that you can't know. <laughs> Because God has given you more than you could have ever imagined. You are wealthy in eternal terms beyond uh, what you can ever expend on planet Earth. And the Holy Spirit, He's all about change, united from the inside out. How many of y'all love change? I want to see the change lovers. Not talking coins in pocket, you know. Some of y'all love change. I love y'all who love change. How many of y'all don't love change so much? All right, all right, you know, a little more of those guys, and then a lot of you all going, I just don't want to talk about it. I would require change. <laughs> Every change involves a loss, and, and it also involves a gain, and so the good changes, you know, the, the, the gain uh, outweighs the, the losses. When you're single and you're getting married, you lose some things as a single guy, and some, some single guys forget that they're losing some things, you know? But gentlemen, wouldn't you all agree that we've gained so much more? The answer to save your marriage is yes. Absolutely. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. So, so the change that Jesus asks us to live is, is not moralism. It's a change from the inside out. Cultural Christianity and corporate religion neither knows nor cares about the Holy Spirit and are perfectly content to live without Him. And so, in, in, a, uh, you know, in a corporate, like sometimes denominational, not always, um, sometimes uh, church, not always, um, you know, it's just more corporate than, than Christ. And it's less the sense of heaven than, than the, you know, the work of business and and that is, that is not Jesus. You see, this isn't moralism that we're talking about. Um, moralism is you know, learning about good things and then striving to be better. You know, I, I should be more kind. Okay, I'm going to work on kindness. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to be kind. What? What do you want? Moralism is, you know, there's, there's no lust. Okay, I will not lust. Wow, look at that. No, I will not. Wow, no, I will not. But the change of the Holy Spirit is inside out. And the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. And, and so it is not us trying harder. It is us simply uh, yielding to love. And finding that in our weakness and broken, we are able to operate out of a power that is supernatural. It's not us. We didn't have the power to do this. Some of you have been in circumstances, for instance, in, in the face of a, of a loss, a devastating loss of someone you loved. And, and, and you have just felt the, the comfort of God in a time where people around you are going, how can you not be crazy right now? But you have experienced the peace that passes understanding. 
because the Holy Spirit from the inside out was doing a work in your heart and you were letting him. See, this is about a life exchange. This is about having a new center. This, this is about um, having a spirit transplant. Galatians 5, 17 says this, um, For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature, listen to this, and they are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want to do. Wow, that's like crazy. You know, there's the term schizophrenia that we use in some psychological senses that speaks of a disintegration of personality, but the truth is that in sin, all of life is disintegrated, and we are at war with ourselves. We are, we are separated from ourselves. And, and, and now, when, when we accept the gift of Jesus' life and we begin living Jesus, we don't do this again by learning some principles and ideals and aspiring to, uh, to rise up to them. No, no, no. We, we, we live the Jesus life by letting Jesus live in us. And, and we begin to, to think his thoughts, not because we're simply educating from the outside, but because we have the mind of Christ in us. And we have the spirit of Christ in us. And so as we yield, we live. Now in Scripture, in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verse 12, verses 3, chapter 3, the Scripture tells us that there are three kinds of people. There is the, the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. The natural or lost person who lives rejecting Jesus' message is, is just the, 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 the lost man, the, the lost person. And and the lost person, the scripture says in verse 14, it describes him this way. Um, it describes him as, as by being natural. In other words, he's just doing what people of the world do. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. So the spirit of God is sending and revealing and, and uh, leading and guiding and seeking to empower, but the natural man uh, rejects all that the Spirit is doing and revealing, and it, it makes no sense. Uh, it is not acceptable, wanted, welcomed, or anything else. There's just like this shield rejecting everything that the Spirit of God would send uh, to their heart. And all the things that come from the Spirit of God to the natural man, the Scripture says they are foolishness to him. You can't understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And that's the case with those who are lost in the world. And, and when you and I are, are talking to someone about Jesus without the Spirit's work, it really is the Charlie Brown teacher classroom experience. You all remember that, right? Wah, 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 wah. And the kids are out there going, huh? When we receive Christ, we get a translator, the Holy Spirit. Sadly, though, the simple truth is that, that there's this category of Christian um, that is called the carnal man. And the carnal person is the believer who lives in their own thinking and in their own feeling. It looks something kind of like this. So imagine these two glasses are people. They both have a relationship with Jesus. And the colored water, it represents the influence that the Holy Spirit has on their lives. So two people, Christ followers, they have the Holy Spirit. But as you can tell, it's a little empty. And that's because we often pour ourselves out into other people, passions, and projects. The Holy Spirit's still there it just maybe isn't as strong as it once was. Now, they both have options, as we all do. They could choose just not to refill their glass. In that case, there's not a whole left to work with, and uh, they're probably going to start to turn inward, draw distant from God, and ultimately disconnected. But let's say this one right here, let's say that this person wants to refill their glass. When they do, they reach for worldly influence. And as they do, they turn to old habits. 
they get busy, stop praying, stop reading their Bible, they choose selfishness over self-control, lust over love, jaded over joy, ultimately that spirit just gets diluted. But this person, they have another choice, and they're going to make it. They're going to turn to the Holy Spirit. And as they turn to the Holy Spirit, they start to pray for that fire they once had to be rekindled. They turn to the Word for encouragement. They turn to Jesus for grace and forgiveness. And ultimately, that spirit, not only is there more influence, but it becomes stronger, deeper, and more vibrant. So we, all, we have three choices. We can run on empty, we can dilute the spirit, or we can replenish it. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, because you weren't ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready, for you are still worldly. For there is jealousy and quarreling among you. Are you not worldly? And then I love the last line of 1 Corinthians 3, 3. Are you not acting like mere men? Aren't you acting like just regular, normal human beings? Well, what's wrong with that? Because just regular human beings don't know Jesus. And they're going to hell. And they're rejecting Christ. And they're missing the glory of God the infinite. And that is not you. And so the reality is, is the carnal believer is the, the person who's just learned to, to settle. I mean, there's no passion anymore. There's no belief. There's no fire. There's no conviction. There's no repentance. Hope is lost. Joy is gone. The, the belief that God can do anything, that, that he is the God of the impossible, those, those words that, that they, they knew in the past where God said in Jeremiah 32, 27, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Those, those kind of possibilities in the face of job, in the face of kids, in the face of the husband or the wife, all of those words are merely almost mocking echoes in their ear. And there's a quiet anger and a quiet resentment of God, and, and, and there's not yet a walking away from Jesus and church, but there is there's just self. Are you not acting like mere human beings? You were meant for so much more. You were called to so much more. You were called to be extraordinary. You were called to live a life lifted, empowered, inspired, um, illuminated. You were called to live a life that was not about the fallenness of your flesh and its desires. You were called to live a life connected to eternity. And connected to eternity, you were called to be uh, something that, that people bound in time could, could sense the awe and wonder of God through. That's who you were called to be. There is extraordinary in you. You have the mind of Christ. You have the love of God. You have all the resources of heaven. And yet, so many of us choose to live carnal lives, not led by the Spirit. And our language is not Spirit-led, and our relationships, we never think about the Spirit. We never check what we say by, by what the, the fruit of the Spirit is. We give ourselves permission to be proud. We give ourselves permission to be uh, angry. We give ourselves permission to think about us. And let me just tell you, I, I'm just making a prediction here um, that that we, we make this category of carnal Christians a very large category, but I, I, I fear that it is actually a very small category. And that the larger category is of people who think they're Christians, but simply are not. The third kind of man, the scripture said, is the spiritual man. The person who yields their pride to Jesus' humility, their feelings to divine revelation, and they're thinking to the Holy Spirit's lead. However, it is written, no eye has seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, nor ear heard, nor mind conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by the Spirit. And no matter how hard life is, or, or how sad things can be, or how broken things might be, we, we live inspired. 
We live a life where, where a greater life has been revealed. We, we live looking through the veil and the fog does not blind us to the joy that lies ahead. And it gives us a hope that drives us forward. And we are relentless in this broken world for God. We live Jesus. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit's, a man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. That's the gift and the invitation. But we have the mind of Christ. And the simple reality is that the truth of who's living in us is revealed in the actions of what's coming out of us. And so, I want to challenge you today that if you're serious about your faith, if you're serious about, about the meaning of life, if you're, if you're curious about what's next in eternity, um, the, the witness of this book and of, of, of every page is... Jesus. And you were not called to admire Jesus. You were not called to learn his teachings alone. You were called to let Jesus live in you and that living Jesus, that you would be a revelation to the world, that you would be a witness. But the only way to live Jesus is in the power of his spirit. And the only way to have the power of his spirit is to yield all the broken of your spirit. There's a lot of sad gathered in here today. A lot of angry. There's, there's a lot of, of lust. A lot of, of the lost. A lot of lonely. A lot of unhappy. And in it all, there is Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And he's a knowable son, a reachable son. <laughs> he is a livable son. And whoever believes, not in a non-changing religious way, but whoever really believes in a soul-deep, spirit-exchange way, will have everlasting life. An everlasting life that doesn't begin when we die, but starts here and now. Changing the broken marriage into a livable marriage changing a hopeless job into a mission field, changing self-hate into, into uh, love for God and, and others and wonder at what he has done. It is a transforming love, but it's all through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and its competing desires. Since we live by the Spirit, by the Spirit, by the Spirit, not by our own wits, not by our own will, not by our own way of thinking. We are a people called to live in the power of God's Spirit. But in order for that to happen, we have to lay down our broken spirit and we have to, to let the Spirit of God fill us and keep step with the Spirit. The Spirit of God is always doing new and great things. New joy, new love, new life. The Spirit of God is always bringing about new mercy. The mercies of God are new every morning. Today, you and I have a fundamental change. Fundamental possibility. An opportunity that changes everything from this point forward. We can live lost where the things of, of God and the story of Christ really makes no sense and is unattractive to us. We'd rather have our own way. We can live carnal, where we, we have the outward forms of Jesus, but there is no surrender of our own pride and arrogance and ego and, and self-thought to Jesus, and so that only the thoughts of Jesus live inside us. We can live carnal and unhappy, angry, frustrated. Or we can live by the Spirit. 
Today, I want to challenge you to receive what has been sent to you. You imagine perhaps a life uh, so great if Jesus were physically with you day by day. Jesus imagined something greater by giving you his spirit. It's time to open the door. It's time to receive the spirit of God. If you've never committed your life to Christ, the one who committed his life completely to you, today it's time for you to commit your life to Christ. How do you do that? Well, it's really simple. It's right here on the back. And, and, and we'll be up here at the front to pray with you about that as well. But I'm going to ask us not to be um, proud religious people, but, but humble saved people, yielding saved people. And I'm going to ask us today, um, as answering God's call to be a house of prayer, that we get on our knees today and that we confess our sin, that we yield our broken, and that we invite the Spirit of God to take over our living. If you want to live the rest of your life as a mere ordinary human being, okay, what a waste. What a loss for the rest of the world. What a broken you're going to pass on to the next generation. But if you long for something more, something stirring in your heart for the awe and wonder that God created you to live, then I'm going to ask you to get on your knees today here um, and, and, and in the, the aisles around you, if this is filled, if you're in a dress or your knees don't work, I totally understand. It's perfectly okay. But I'm going to ask you today, yielding, invite the Spirit of God in. Confess sin. Turn the page to a new life. And today, give God your broken spirit and commit to a spirit-led life. Would you stand and then would you come and kneel and yield? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that we would receive the spirit that he died to give. And I ask that all over this, this auditorium, Father, that there would be eternal work done in these moments, that, Spirit, you would come and draw and speak and reveal uh, this morning in a way that would change our destinies. Jesus, beyond feeling, we believe and we yield. Would you come and encourage and in favor.